put it on this computer. Okay, cool. So now anybody who's gonna join later can do so. Come on. So I'm going to start off with just a brief slide set. So welcome to the Friday tutorial. Hopefully um, this is gonna be fun and exciting. Um, hang on, I'm gonna try and mute everyone first so we don't get... Uh, <clears throat> Yeah, you may want to look into if there's a way to mute everyone by default, because I know that's how it yeah. works with uh, his lectures, but I'm not sure where the setting for that is. Yeah, I only got the latest Zoom Pro <laughs> recently, and there's a lot more buttons than the non-free version. Um, I'll try and get that figured out for next class. For now, if everybody could just mute themselves, or I don't know if I have participants. Let me mute all. Mute all. Okay, cool. And you guys are allowed to unmute yourselves. So if you have any questions, just unmute yourselves and then, uh, yeah, we can get started. What I'm going to do first is pull up my second screen. And we'll start off with just a brief uh, rundown. I just put a quick presentation together to give you an idea of what uh, these Friday tutorials are going to be like. Um, I'll probably start off each with uh, basically just a, a, a brief rundown on uh, basically what we plan on covering and so forth. So today we're going to be looking at linear and logistic regressions. I understand you guys covered some of that in yesterday's class, uh, as well as a car. So there's two notebooks. If you guys uh, check out the See so You Learn, I basically will try and post before the Friday lecture uh, information on what we plan on covering. So you guys can hopefully take a look at that uh, before we get started. Um, so basically these lectures or these tutorials are going to be your intro to applied machine learning. So while the course itself is intro to machine learning, this is basically where more of the kind of hands-on application will be. So it'll be application focused. Um, basically this is where we try to, or I'm going to try to get you guys, uh, with, uh, prepared with more practical machine learning hands-on skills. Of course, we're going to be doing this through things like Jupyter notebooks. Uh, you're free to watch, but I would encourage to try and follow along if you can. What these won't be though is debugging sessions. So if maybe there's an error in the way something's been set up or uh, cells may not have been uh, run in the right order or there are issues in your specific implementation, um, I don't want to have to debug <laughs> each of those just for the sake of time. It won't make sense to do that either. Uh, but I encourage you basically to follow along if there are things that don't make sense, ask questions about it. I'll hope to um, basically clarify what any issues might be. Um, and yeah, we're also not going to be solving other questions or problems in the course. The idea here is that uh, basically the material covered in the tutorials is just additional and complementary uh, so that you guys can really get a good hands-on feel for what is the art and science of machine learning. Who am I? So just a brief history of my background and what I do. Um, I have a bachelor's in biology and computer science at McGill. Um, I actually took an AI course under Joël Pinot, who is a uh, Facebook AI director, or she is now, she wasn't at the time, but um, it was a really phenomenal course. It basically covers some of the, some of the elements that this course covers. Uh, I worked for a year for a company called Galvian afterwards. They were formerly Revision Military. It was more electrical engineering, intelligent battery system type stuff. Uh, and then in 2015, I started at Carleton in my master's, but I never finished it. I instead fast-tracked to PhD, and that's where you find me now, hopefully trying to finish that. Uh, just to give you an idea, this is kind of the gamut of projects I've covered in the past, just to give you a general sense. Um, right now I'm looking at things like chaos game representations, it's like a fractal base type thing. Um, I do a lot of computer vision stuff as well, so keystone correction, if you're familiar with um, different like camera perspectives, or uh, me and another student are looking at basically um, how we can compare different types of corrections on images that might be in the natural environment. Um, I have a whole side project that I had done as part of um, other grant applications where uh, it's all computer vision related with natural environment photos. So basically extracting gas prices from autonomous vehicle sourced imagery, so on and so forth. A lot of this other stuff is kind of more bio related. Um, uh, I'll have these slides posted online, so if you have any interest in any of these projects or want to know more, just feel free to email me or ask questions if you want. 
And this is something I'm going to also do every week, just briefly before we start, what I call ML Weekly. Um, one thing that's really important in the machine learning community is to really stay up to date. It moves very fast, even you know from a few years ago, the way things were being done or what was kind of state of the art then um, changes very dramatically, very quickly. So uh, my hopes, at least within ML Weekly, is whatever's happened in the last week, maybe from the, the machine learning community, I'm going to try and uh, um, emphasize or highlight those things here. And I would encourage you guys to kind of just always stay up to date with what's going on as well. Um, unfortunately, this week, there's not too much that I could fig like find um, before uh, throwing this all together before this uh, tutorial. But two things that are notable. So if you're a gamer at all, um, you're probably aware that uh, NVIDIA had just put out these new 30 or like 3000 series cards, and they were basically instant sold out. Why is this ML related? Well, I mean, GPUs are a kind of cornerstone um, hardware bit that's useful. And well, from the specs or what uh, is being announced that these cards can, can do, uh, anybody who wants to do kind of deep learning on their own devices um, and using uh, kind of the latest and greatest of tensor cores, um, anyways, you can't really get your hands on these, I hear, anymore. And another thing that's kind of interesting, uh, this is, again, just uh, I'm going to open this one up. Um, just different applications or things that are interesting, uh, how people have used uh, kind of the latest and greatest in language models. So a college student here used G GPT-3 to write fake blog posts that ended up at the top of Hacker News. So anyways, good to kind of just, uh, yeah, this is not latest in developments, but just how people are using different models. And I mean, is this even ethical to, to do is a whole other question as well. And so, without further ado, that basically wraps out these. I'll try and uh, put a few more in the ML weeklies uh, for next week. Um, so today, if you've checked out the, uh, close that down. Where's my C Learn? So on C Learn, we have lectures. Two notebooks. So what I would encourage you to do is open these up in Jupyter or Google Colab, Jupyter Notebook, whatever it might be, um, just to have it running on the side. So what I have currently, it's an F19. Let's go. So this is my. We're gonna start with Cars linear regression. Or uh, yeah, let's start with this one. I'll open this. Question. Both, yep. Go for it. So the tutorial one mentioned both uh, Google Collab, Jupyter Notebook, and Jupyter Lab to set up locally. Yep. Uh, do we need all three of those, or which it, should we be using to open this up? No. So you can you can set up all three because it gives you some flexibility. Although I wouldn't Jupyter Notebook and Jupyter Lab are basically the same environment. I would, if I had a preference between the two, I'd say go with Jupyter uh, Lab because that's what this is here. It has basically the ability to kind of navigate um, different file folders, right? So this is basically, if you recognize the GitHub repo, um, just like a local copy right now. Uh, so you can kind of just double click, open up any of these. You can look at your CSVs. Under the launcher, you can also spin up a terminal. So like echo, I don't know, hi. Um, you can basically run your commands uh, locally within this without having to you know, jump to your terminal or not. Um, so either one of the two, I would say Jupyter Lab is my preferred just because it's the most kind of flexible. Uh, Jupyter or uh, Google Colab, you should also gain some familiarity familiarity with because it has free uh, GPU access. So if ever you need to kind of train something or like fine tune a model and you need GPU usage and your computer doesn't have it, best to spin up uh, the notebooks in Colab and take advantage of that resource. If that makes sense. Yeah, right. thanks. Yeah, OK, cool. No worries. So without further ado, what I'll do is I'll start walking through um, basically this car prices and linear regression problem. So uh, I basically just took the, um, the uh, notebook from previous years and just added a bunch of extra info to it and also updated it. So one thing that might become uh, maybe obvious is if you try to run older notebooks that people have written previously, uh, there might be um, library or package conflicts. Um, the way that some of the APIs and the different packages under different versions um, are loaded or modified or the APIs are updated can sometimes run into conflict. Um, but yeah, basically we'll just go through this one first, uh, just kind of like walking through end to end. 
So in this one, uh, basically, we are loading tabular data. Um, so just generally, how do you grab a CSV data? When you grab it, you should look at what the raw variables are. We're going to look at um, some example transformations, um, some exploratory data analysis, and then we're just going to build two essential, well, a couple of different models. So a linear regression and then a logistic regression. The first will be for a regression type problem and then for classification. Um, if anybody has any, has anybody not uh, used a notebook at all, just either in the chat or um, I should find where the chat is. <laughs> okay. Has anybody, so either unmute yourselves or, okay, there's a lot of new messages coming in. Okay, me, 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 I haven't, I haven't, I have not. Okay, cool. So what I'll do is I guess I'll just go over the general basics of what a notebook is. So this, a notebook is basically an interactive um, document where you can put in code cells and markdown cells and different types of cell types. And you can use that to kind of interleave basically in like text information. So this is all in what's known as markdown. It's a special type of markup where these double asterisks are um, like for bold. This is how you create uh, a link to something. So what the text is and, and so on and so forth. So it's basically just a special formatting. Um, and this would be here at the top what was what's known as a markdown cell. And when you run this, so there's, you can either click this run button at the top or there's a shortcut where you hit shift and enter. It basically will like run and execute that. Okay, so, and then if you have others, these ones are code cells, you can actually then run these. So if I run this, this little star here shows that it's actually doing a thing. Um, this is all running locally on my computer, so I'm running it off just a MacBook. Um, but if you have it set up in Google Colab and say you need to, um, uh, control plus enter will move the block down, execute in place. It's uh, it's shift enter, sorry, shift enter. Um, if you're running this in Colab and you need dependencies, there's this uh, thing that you can throw in front. So this is uh, just like a exclamation point, which means run it as a shell command. So these are being run um, as if it was in a Python interpreter, but if you need to run it as if it's in the shell, you would do something like this pip install, whatever, you know. Um, so if you run into any issues, at least with uh, dependencies, you can try that. So here, usually at the top of a notebook, we'll want to have all the uh, general libraries, packages, everything that we're going to need later on. Um, sometimes it's good practice to put these closer to the actual cells. Like if you have a really long notebook, sometimes you'll want to maybe import these closer to where you're actually using them. Um, but since this notebook's pretty, pretty small, uh, we don't need to do that. Um, yeah, so here is where we first load the data. So the file that we're going to be grabbing is on someone's GitHub repo. It's basically a whole CSV of Toyota Corolla historical data, just a number of different features. Um, what this does is basically load it into um, a data frame. And here we're actually just for convenience setting the data frame uh, with the headers that we want. This is just another way that you could do it. You can access different columns of that data frame by calling on each of those uh, variable names. Here's just a way that you can kind of unpack them into uh, specific variables. So it would do something like this. At the bottom, what we could do, um, so to whatever the last line of this, if you want um, to print something out, is what will be printed. So if we did something like data frame, in this case, uh, head, what this does is it grabs basically the first five lines. And you can see that there are prices in this column. There's uh, the age of the vehicle in kilometers, fuel type, here is a string, and so on and so forth. So these are basically the variables that have been loaded up. Um, if you want to get a general sense of how, um, oops, how many there are. So this is, this is 1436 rows, so different cars, 10 different variables. And so then we can start examining those raw variables. So one thing that's uh, useful within also Jupyter Notebooks is the ability to just generate these nice visual displays. So here what I did, um, previous versions of this, the 2019 just had like different plots on each. You could like comment or uncomment these. I, I changed this up so that all that we're doing is just changing um, the name of the variable that we want. And then we basically just grab that from the data frame. So similar as the way that we were accessing these up here, if I want age, well, then here I'm just going to grab the age variable, 
plot it as a histogram in the color gray, edges black, so on and so forth, add some labels. Um, and this is, if you had looked at what I wrote about um, in tutorial one, if you're not familiar with this, this is called an F string in, um, in Python. So it's Python 3.7 up, I believe. Um, super useful for throwing in uh, kind of variable values as part of strings. So instead of using like plus concatenation for strings and, and whatnot, or um, using like a dot format, then you can really just throw on this F in front, these curly braces within. And then now whenever we run this, like this is price. So price here is that bar to plot, which is this thing here. So what we're doing here is basically just plotting the distributions of them. If I change this to age and rerun, we can do it this way. If I do it um, in, I don't know, horsepower, this is the plot for it. So what you can look is basically across your data set, here's the number of you know, vehicles by count that have, you know, a given horsepower. Like only very few have more than 100 and what is that, 90 horsepower and so on and so forth. So it's a way to just like initially, what's the hashtag for? This is a comment. So in Python, you comment things out. So here, this doesn't run. This is just me uh, throwing this on as afterwards to say you can add these ones in just as a reminder. Any other questions for now? Are you doing pretty good? Okay, good, good, good. So um, there's a lot of uh, these nice functions that um, data frames have. So one of them is this like dot describe. It's just a way to kind of grab all the summary statistics of, uh, of the different variables available in your data frame. So it gives you just a count. It, it, it runs these all as uh, floats and whatnot, but um, it gives you your mean, your standard, deviation, min, a few of the uh, percentiles and then your, your max. So just a good way to get a handle on without having to visualize each of these, get a sense for what the distributions or at least the summary statistics of your distributions are um, across your data frame. And now one thing, so one thing I'll ask you guys here, if I were to throw this in as a fuel type, does anyone know why this will then throw me an error? Either in the chat or comments. String type, exactly. Yeah, so because it's a string, um, these are all numerical types within um, the, the data frame. So when we had looked at, let me go back, just throw on the head here. Um, these were like diesel, 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 so on and so forth. So histograms don't take this type. And that's one of the important things that we, when we get to data transformation, um, that's important. So an important point here, data are seldom arranged in the way that you want them. So usually you'll have to transform them in some way, clean it up. This is like, we, we like to think that machine learning is a glorified uh, development of these amazing models. But to be perfectly honest, a lot of it is ac actually at this stage, trying to get your variables and whatnot into a format um, that actually works, that's clean, and that represents your problem well. So because um, linear regression models and logistic regressions models um, will normally only take uh, numerical variables, we'll want to then turn the fuel type into an actual numerical type data. So right now it has three um, different types of labels, CNG, I think for changeable, like it can be either, and then diesel or petrol. So in this case, um, all that this cell does here is we're just printing out in the fuel type, um, so this is that like unpacked variable that we have. We can just do like the DF fuel type um, access. We want to find the number of unique labels. So that's what these are. So we can see what they are. Then we want to count um, the number of each. So in this case, um, this is a bit verbose. You don't necessarily have to do it all this way, but um, like I can throw this. So this is using the NumPy sum library we're saying find all instances where fuel type is equal to the value change, that will print, basically produce um, a vector of like true false statements. So wherever it's false, that's kind of a zero. Wherever it's true, that's a one. So by summing those, we basically see where, what, are, what is the sum of all the true times that fuel type is changed. And we do that for each of these. Again, here's a beautiful F string. Um, you can use these like, these are tab, Delimiter. So instead of like spacing things over, you can throw in a tab. So this is like a really convenient way to kind of get your um, labels to, to line up beautifully. We see that 17 are interchangeable, 155 are diesel, and as we would expect, the majority are going to be um, petrol. 
So um, the way that we're going to convert these then into a numeric type data, um, we're going to assign change to a new, uh, basically we're going to create two new variables, fuel type one. So a one in fuel type one is going to be changeable and zero if it's not. And then for fuel type two, we will put a one that represents if it's diesel and zero if it's not. So basically what we're, all that we're trying to do is just like re-encode that string into kind of these uh, binary type variables, right? So it's gonna be basically a columns of ones or zeros. The way that we can do that, um, we find all cases where uh, the fuel type is uh, change. We multiply that by one. This is just like a quick hack to ensure um, that we get a numeric representation. We're not uh, getting Boolean variables. Um, so that uh, we don't fill the column with true falses, we instead just uh, fill it with ones and zeros. So here is the way that you create a new column. So if you recall, we had, like here, fuel type still exists. These are the same columns that we had before. Um, here it's kind of skipping over to this next line. We see fuel type one, fuel type two. Um, these are basically being set in. So that was just, again, running this uh, head command um, to just show, show those up at the top. So now that this is cleaned up, um, one thing that we didn't do here is drop. Can I repeat that? Uh, can you ask what it is to repeat? How to set a variable? From J to everyone. Again, guys, feel free to uh, unmute yourselves and, and throw your questions out as well. If, uh, is everyone clear up at this point or is there anything want, does anyone? Zero and one. So um, the idea here, so let me just uh, actually show what this looks like. So let me make a new cell. So here, if I run this command, I'm saying, so fuel type, this is um, basically just a single column vector of fuel type. If I run this, it basically, these are the indices, wherever the fuel type is CNG, um, per index, it's going to be either false, 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 or true, wherever it is in fact true. If we take the result of this, so this, when we run it, produces this vector of uh, true-false um, columns. If I just multiply this by one, instead of getting falses, I get zeros, right? This is basically a, like a quick hack to typecast. I'm not sure if we can be a bit more explicit. Sorry, I'm gonna do it this way. So if we did instead um, uh, like int, of these yeah so this isn't this is going to be an error because the the int typecast requires like a single representation of some value a single string a single um float or whatever um to typecast it can't do it over a vector we could do this with like a lambda expression if uh you guys are familiar with those at all where um basically or like an l apply there's like different types of vector applications that can be done um but the quickest, easiest, and I think in my case, cleanest hack is just to multiply that entire thing by one. Yeah, Python hack for cac thing as an end, exactly. Thank you, Xander. So if that's clear, I think I'm going to keep moving forward. I'm gonna cut this guy out. Um, so yeah, all that was done really just to get everything set up into this uh, Numeric format. What we would also like to do, I don't know if I, I think I'd do it later. Um, I dropped this column. We don't want to have um, this string based representation of fuel type as well as these fuel types, um, but I'll get to that at some point. So, in this next section, we get into what's called exploratory data analysis, EDA. Uh, the idea here is we want to start getting a better sense for um, how different variables relate to one another. Um, like what kind of uh, like behaviors or um, distributions do they share uh, together? This is a bit more verbose. I would have maybe done something a bit um, like loopy to try and uh, put these all together, but this gives you a good idea as to how uh, different subplots are uh, generated together. So um, all that this does is it creates a figure of a certain size and then for basically, I think it's just like a five by four, Anyways, it's like nine different um, variables being displayed. Um, each of these is basically just like setting one of those. And what we get then are, you know, price versus age. So whatever kind of negative correlated type trend we see there, price versus kilometers. Basically, how does price uh, vary depending on the variable? Uh, in this case, whether it's a diesel vehicle or not, this is what we could uh, see as being binary, binary variable. So the, those were, again, 
uh, zeros or ones. Um, and other types of like, uh, you know, these are int, so your number of doors won't be a float type value. You'll have either two door, three door, four door, or five door, and your prices will vary uh, in accordance with those. And so when you first start throwing these together, because price is the thing that we're, we're interested in looking at, um, which one of these better as histograms, bar graphs? Yeah, yeah. There, there's different ways that you could represent some of these just to get a better um, sense. This is just one way to do it. Um, but we want to we want to see a few different trends that emerge when looking at certain variables age as they relate to price. So newer cars tend to be more expensive is a very intuitive um, insight that we see from that. So if we look at age, um, your age if it's low, your car price is high. Your age when it's <laughs> high, your car price is typically low. Like that's usually expected. Cars depreciate pretty quickly in value. Um, kilometers, the more kilometers a car has, the cheaper it is, would be here. So if your kilometers are relatively low, they tend, the price tends to be low. If the kilometers are relatively high, you can see this kind of, the, this kind of distribution going on here. Horsepower, not directly um, meaningful. The more horsepower, the more expensive, but not always the case. So where's horsepower? Horsepower, yeah. So it's like what you'll see in certain of these variables is kind of if across different values of horsepower, so here the higher the horsepower, the higher the price, but even relatively low, like say uh, at a price of $10,000, you know, you could have any one of these. Like for $10,000, you're not going to get this guy, but you can. For ten thousand dollars, you can get any one of these. Um, so yeah, it's just a kind of a getting a, a good intuition. Metallic color doesn't seem to be useful. Transmission type doesn't have that much of an influence. CC the engine size um, seems that larger engines are more expensive, so on and so forth. Like I'd invite you guys um, even like after this, make sure that as you're going through uh, these examples, you you see those intuitions yourselves. Um, and so once we have a good idea as to um, so yeah, this is like just this terminal statement. When you have tabular data, the insights of EDA, like for those who ever end up going on as like data scientists and whatnot, finding those relationships um, are what you use to kind of like tell the story. Like what is it about you know a certain client base who buys things at a certain point of time? What is it about characteristics that they have that you you know give a sense of the story as to why the data is distributed and behaves in the way that it does? So let's kind of just move on from that and get now into more of the uh, meat and potatoes of things. So now we're going to actually build a linear regression model. So we'll just consider, um, okay, um, we're basically going to pull out these independent variables. So X is uh, the convention of the machine learning community for um, your features, like your, your X variables, and then your Ys are... Uh, your target, your dependent. So in this case, what we're doing is we're just saying grab all the columns that have uh, these names, and I think in this case represented as um, a NumPy array. Um, and all that we then do is pass these into our model. So this is um, ordinarily squares, so OLS, and we're just fitting a model to it. We're then going to, for all our, um, our data points, those features, so that, again, we, we're, we don't want the price included. We, we see that uh, price isn't one of these. Um, we want to basically have our model predict what it thinks the price, that Y variable is. And then we can basically get a, a summary of that. So it's actually pretty quick. Once you have your data kind of set up, throwing it then into a model is just a couple of lines of code. Um, and in this case, uh, using this uh, summary breakdown, um, we get a whole bunch of information kind of uh, laid out, so like the number of observations we have. Um, the R squared is actually what we're going to be most interested in here. And we also see per, um, per variable, we see uh, what the breakdown in its coefficient, its T statistics are, um, its P value, uh, which is going to be a, a little important later on, and so on and so forth. So these basically give you a breakdown of what your model is. So when interpreting this, we can see that the model output, um, we capture 86.9, so this is the multiple R squares value here, um, of the variation in price. So it's actually pretty good. Add constant X. So the SM add constant X, so this is just a, um, so SM I think is our stats module. Um, this is just adding, uh, it's the way of kind of uh, 
add in your variables to, or like, um, uh, I think augmenting your variables so that you can then use them in the model later. So it's just uh, an initial setup uh, to frame then your your OLS. I think if you if you don't add that uh, augmented column, this then will throw you an error. So yeah. So getting back to to just this breakdown, um, we'll also notice that some coefficients are more statistically significant than others. So t statistics are one way to do that. Um, there's also you can look at the the uh, p-value as well. So the larger the magnitude of your statistic, kind of the more meaningful or important that one is. So if you look at like age, for example, it's like very negative um, weight as well seems to be. So when we look at that, yeah, so the most significant is age with a p-value of this, weight with a p-value of that. The least significant ones, metallic color, number of doors. So this kind of helps just confirm what we, you know, the uh, the results or the outcomes of uh, the EDA that we had done before, like we can kind of figure out which uh, variables seem to be more meaningful or less meaningful than others. Um, and we can kind of confirm, confirm that actually like more uh, quantitatively in a, in a sense um, by looking at the actual, what does the model uh, leverage uh, kind of the most in coming up with its, uh, its, its predicted price. Um, and yeah, so, so what we did was we basically predicted on the entire data set, right? All that we did was we, we used the entire data set uh, to generate our model and then we applied all our predictions to that. So that's actually a really bad idea. So you would never use the entire uh, data set to uh, train your entire model. What we want to do is train the model on a sample on like a subset of that data and a, a representative subset of that data and then perform uh, and then see how it performs outside of the training sample, right? So the idea here is if you have a relatively large data set and you're able to uh, subsample a representative set of those, if you train on those distributions and then test on that kind of unseen data, that gives you a much better confidence in how your model is going to behave and generalize when new data comes in, like well, future data or data that um, was never even part of your training set in the first place. So it gives you a better uh, confidence in the generalizability of your model. Uh, and so to do that, to split up into a training and test set, um, yeah, we can basically do something along these lines. So again, we're just grabbing uh, each of the variables. And here what we're doing is we're just taking the first thousand samples. So here, uh, this notation, for those who are perhaps less familiar in Python, says start at the zeroth index and then go all the way to the 1,000th minus one. So um, basically, this, is, uh, this one is excluded. Um, so this will basically be the thousand first uh, instances. Again, that uh, we're adding uh, that constant or just like setting this up for uh, the model. And we have to do the same with the Y's. We don't want to use all 1436 um, Y values. We only want to, as part of our training set, only consider the top thousand samples. And so this is now our second model. So instead of using the original full data set, we're just using the top 1000 true values the top 1,000 um, features, fitting the model, and then we're predicting, in this case, on the training set, but then we can also predict it on the test set to evaluate later. So we do this on the training set to get a sense for um, just the uh, performance of our model on the training set. So again, 86.4 here. We can also confirm would it be better to shuffle the data set? So what, yes, in theory. So um, so one of the questions in the chat, Xander asked if, uh, if shuffling the data set first and then subsampling um, makes sense. Generally, yes. Um, I, we're not doing it here because it's just like it's, a, it's an additional step, but um, we can assume that there's, uh, the data set is already in an order that is more or less random, uh, but it's a good point. Normally what you would want to do is for a given data set, shuffle them into a different order because you're trying to grab like an independent subset of samples each time. Uh, and then what was the negative value significant? So Jay asks, um, so uh, anyway, just on the shuffle thing, if uh, to just to make sure it's clear with everyone, um, there's like other techniques in model evaluation where uh, you'll kind of like repeatedly um, shuffle your data set, you'll repeatedly grab um, a subset of the data, you'll create a model, you'll test its performance and kind of repeat that whole thing over and over and over again, because that will give you then a range of the expected values 
of uh, performance on your data set. I think we actually touch on that later, so I'll, I'll be able to show that then. Um, assuming we have time, we're gonna have to maybe speed things up a bit. Um, I'm gonna maybe not do questions so much just so that I can kind of burn through some of these and then maybe do a bunch of uh, questions. Or I guess, Chris, thanks, if you're gonna also answer questions, hopefully on my behalf. Um, I'm gonna forge forward though, just so that we can hopefully start touching on the other uh, notebook at some point before the end. But as always, you guys can probably go through these after the fact um, and bring questions uh, later. Um, so model interpretation, what's important here uh, is we want to actually evaluate the uh, performance of the model. So, oops, sorry. Um, so I don't know why this is. Hidden. Okay, well anyways, there's a few different metrics that you can consider. Um, so when we're predicting on the out of sample, we need to measure you know, how right or how wrong or how uh, correct was our prediction. So the price that was predicted by our model, how close is it to the, um, to the actual value? So one of those is MAE, the mean absolute error. So this is basically across that entire set of samples. We're just um, calculating the, the um, the absolute error that we see. So whether it's a, you overshot it or you undershot it, how, what's the size of the magnitude? What's the average size of that magnitude? So here, obviously, the smaller, the better. Um, so what we're doing here, uh, basically running this whole thing and um, spitting out the mean absolute error. So there are packages that already um, implement this. So we're, we created the model. Um, yeah, so this is just grabbing the test cases. So um, Again, the notation is starting at the thousandth point. So now we're going and grabbing everything that was left over, um, setting it up for the model on the Y instead of, so we had considered the training top 1000. Now we're starting at the thousandth and going down to the last. So by leaving this blank, it means just run to the end. So grab everything else. Um, and now for that second model, we're predicting the value. So the testing results is basically the estimated price for each of those um, those uh, Ys that we had originally. And then now we're just using uh, this statistical package. Um, mean abs is the mean absolute uh, error function where we pass in the Y value, the actual price and the testing results, the estimated price, and we print out the MAE. So here, what this tells us is the average error that we'll have on any given car is plus or minus generally around just under $1,000, right? Nine, $988.87. If that MAE was zero, that means we got it right every single time. Like it was, it was exact. So yeah, the predicted value would perfectly match the actual value. Um, and then there's just a few other um, of these regression type uh, error metrics. So root mean squared is just another, um, and there are packages that, that have it. And so uh, this one, the way that it differs from the others is it won't put as much uh, emphasis on, or it will, it will penalize outliers a little uh, more. So it's uh, just another, like they're more or less analogous. Um, they just differ slightly in interpretation. And then mean absolute percent error. So uh, basically this is just a way to represent instead your error. So I might as well just run these just to make sure. Everything's good, but this is now just representing it instead as a percentage instead of an actual value. So we're off by about 12% of any given car's actual price on average. Um, so yeah, so that's basically just like a simple regression. So like just developing a model um, that can perform decently well um, in predicting price. What we'll do now, just so that we can hopefully get to the other notebook in time, is go over logistic regression. So now we're changing the problem instead to one where we want to classify, a binary classification task. So the way that we set this up is we say, let's assume we have $10,000 to spend, um, and we use that as a criteria. So instead of considering just the price, we say, if the price is lower than 10,000, then yes, I can afford that. So that's class one, that's a positive label. Um, and if it's greater than 10,000, that's over my budget, I can't afford it, so that's zero. I can't afford that car. So what we're going to do, so actually, yeah, this is where I drop fuel type because uh, we need to get rid of non-numeric fuel types here. So this is just the way that you say in your data frame. So what we're doing is we're actually making a copy as well. Copy the data frame, drop the column that's fuel type and save that to data frame too. Cash on hand is 10,000. And here we just apply that logic again uh, to set the price. So if the price is less than or equal to the amount of cash on hand, that's a true, in the case that it's less than a thousand and false otherwise multiply by one to get that into an int 
format, that's going to be the price. We're now saying override that entire column that had all the actual vehicle price value, set that to, well, basically this, to true or false for whether or not we can afford it. So here, price now, if we took, take the head of that, um, are zeros, and later on, they'll actually be, why are we dropping fuel type? Yeah, fuel type is the string type. So um, remember, we have fuel type one that encodes binary labels. Fuel type two is ones. And previously, before, we hadn't dropped it, and then it ran into a bunch of errors. So if you look back here, fuel type diesel, this column is meaningless to us. And if we try to pass that um, into other models, that's um, we also got rid of it as a, like a small hack. We were selecting what columns we wanted to use here. We didn't include it, so it didn't cause issues. It's just I'm cleaning it up now. <laughs> But uh, probably better to do it in advance because as soon as you encode those labels, it's probably good to just drop the one that's meaningless. Um, and yeah, so now what we want to do is convert it to a number like we did instead of dropping it. So we did convert it into a number. So sorry, fuel type one, fuel type two are the numeric encodings of diesel, petrol, and change. I'm dropping fuel type that is the string column that contains those. So we can get rid of that, yeah. I'll, uh, I'll correct that for future to get rid of, <laughs> to avoid confusion. Um, so yeah, so now what we want to do is we just want to double check. So this is a binary classification problem. In binary classification problems, something that's really important is we want to avoid instances where you're like extremely imbalanced in the number of classes. So here, all that we're doing is we're just saying uh, for the prices, uh, for the price column, basically just like print it out as a histogram. What are the counts? So we can get a good sense in this case for, you know, we have about six, 600, um, cars we can't afford and about 800 and some that we can. So they're relatively equal in size. That's not bad. One thing that's really important about um, this is that knowing the distribution of your class label is key to being able to understand if your model is actually doing something good or proper. Um, if we have a two class split and 50-50 and we get an accuracy of 50%, that means our model will actually be no better than random chance, like flipping a coin. So it's like, can I afford this car based on these variables? Well, flip a coin, you'll be right half the time, right? Um, without having modeled anything or done anything better. So if, if, the, if you have a 50-50 split, you expect your accuracy to be better than 50. If it's not, it's close to 50, your model is, is just a random model. It doesn't use anything meaningful about the features to actually inform its decision. Um, on the other hand, uh, if the split is say 90, 10, uh, and we get the same accuracy and we get 50%, that's actually pretty good when it's a 90, 10, it's like rolling a 10 sided die. You're going to be right about 10% of the time. So if your accuracy in a 90, 10 split is, you know, 15% or 30%, that's actually much better than uh, one would expect. 50 would actually be pretty good of this 90, 10 split. You're actually right half the time is a lot better than if you had a 50-50 split. Anyways, think about that. Um, maybe like muddle over it just to get a good intuition as to why that's the case. But class imbalance is absolutely a massive, um, it's something that you really have to consider uh, when, when dealing with your models because 99.999% accuracy on a super class imbalanced data set that has 99.9999 negatives and only a couple of positives looks impressive, but it just means that your model will just predict everything as negative or as the majority class. Anyways, I'll uh, leave that to muddle over um, just so we can keep moving forward. So visualizing the feature. So now that we have um, that this like binarization of data, we want to see how different um, variables again. So this is kind of the way that we plotted things before. We want to see um, how those different variables uh, vary relative to one another um, and then also by class. So here that's what's known as a pair plot. This is what I was mentioning before. I tried to run this off the old code book. Um, if you have the wrong kind of, or in like new versions of different packages, in this case, we have to specify, um, this like other variable so that we don't hit this error. Um, but yeah, all that this is doing is for each pair of, um, variables and then also coloring them by class. So what is the distribution of, um, those negative can't afford, and those that I can afford, um, it gives a good intuition. So again, these plots are basically gonna tell us that um, the cars in class one, the ones we can afford, are going to be older, have higher kilometers, and lower horsepower. Um, I will leave it to you to kind of work through uh, looking at each of these. 
Um, something just also to note, uh, only half of this is really relevant. So if you follow the diagonal and take the lower triangular or upper triangular, um, it's basically the same encoded information um, across each. Uh, so don't be too intimidated by kind of like looking at these. Um, but yeah, we want to get a few different insights about this. These plots tell us that linear regression, like things like metallic color, transmission type, so on and so forth, do not distinguish the two classes well. So what we're looking for are features let me zoom in slightly. We're looking for features where these are more or less separate, right? Where you can basically like draw a separating line between the two so that that would be a very strong feature because that means anything that um, falls to the left of that line is going to be a negative. Anything that falls to the right of it is going to be positive, And that's going to be kind of a distinguishing feature that's very valuable. But if they are kind of very overlapped in this way, there's no easy way to kind of, uh, and like in some of these cases, they're completely overlapped. Um, there's no easy way to, uh, to, to separate these distributions out in any type of way, but they can potentially be done um, in combination. So to create the actual logistic regression model, um, here we're gonna follow something relatively similar. We're grabbing a bunch of different features. Um, samples here, what we're doing is we're grabbing 70% uh, as training. So uh, we're saying grab the shape of the uh, data frame, uh, grab the zero width, which is going to be the number of rows, the zero width index, because it comes out as a two tuple. Um, and then we're just going to get the size of the training set is basically that number times 70%, turn that into an int to round it, and then just go grab from the first index. So we could shuffle here, but again, go grab from the first index, go all the way down to whatever that number is. Uh, same for your Ys, same for your testing, you're going to grab from the remainder onwards. Um, and then here, all we're doing is throwing it into a logit model, fitting it, and getting a summary. So again, we get um, a breakdown roughly similar here. What we're going to do here is now something called feature selection. So we're using all the data that's available to us, but some features are going to be, in fact, more important than others for separating out of the cl uh, those classes. So um, here, what we want to do... Uh, so we're going to be looking at those p-values. You don't have to worry too much um, what is the meaning or, I mean, I'm, I'm sure most of you know what, what a p-value is, but we're going to basically look at the p-values. So these here, those that are very small or, the, or like practically near zero, age and kilometers, those we want to keep, those that are a bit larger and less meaningful, so the horsepower, um, the metallic color, whether it's automatic, those we want to quote unquote drop or like not consider. So we're kind of like refining the model to consider only those features that are perhaps more uh, important or salient to the actual task that we're trying to perform here. So here we're only grabbing those, we're dropping, uh, we're keeping age kilometers, automatic, uh, CC doors, weights, and so on and so forth. We rerun the model. And what we're doing is we're just kind of like, again, looking at, uh, in this case, pseudo R squared. Um, and other uh, kind of like model performance metrics, we're looking to see that um, our p-values, as they now are computed in this new model, are there others that are perhaps less useful? So here again in model interpretation, when we remove those other noisy features, we're, uh, we now see that CCs and automatics, um, p-values, or CC and automatic, yeah, these one or sorry, fuel type, this one. So uh, those are now kind of jumping up and being uh, less useful. So we're going to drop those as well. So the salient features, the ones that really will determine whether or not we can afford a given car on a subset of features are age, kilometer, automatic doors, and weight. And we can run that. Um, and then, yeah, so what we can then do is actually test our model. So this final model, we're, we now want to determine what the accuracy or like the, you know, how well does it perform on that out of sample data set? How right or correct are we going to be um, every time? So here what we're doing is we're just basically applying, we're predicting, this gives us um, a probability. We round that to a, a zero one for a binary prediction. That gives us our predicted value Y. And then we're just going to measure out accuracy. So when we do that, we see that we get 97%. So 97% on a 50-50-ish split um, data set is actually really good. So that means our model will be right 97% of the time. So that kind of wraps up this notebook. That took a lot longer than expected, but um, I mean, it's good if uh, we're going over some of the basics.
Um, here at the bottom, these are like the takeaway messages. Uh, basically, all those like really salient points are the ones that I tried to like highlight throughout. They're kind of all here. Um, so if anything, maybe start from this just to get a good sense of uh, everything. Hopefully, the model running and how to use a Jupyter Notebook feels somewhat intuitive or that you'd be able to kind of, again, just like spin this up, explore, like test things out. Um, if you don't have a strong background in Python, I'd suggest just like trying to familiarize yourselves with different types of notation. I'm just gonna like burn through some of these comment or questions. Good. All right. William, okay, good. Thanks, uh, Chris, for jumping in and <laughs> helping out in at least uh, answering a lot of these questions. That's actually pretty helpful. Um, for the rest of the time, I guess we have 10 minutes. I think what I'll do is um, just kind of briefly uh, run you through. Uh, so this is actually uh, created by other two um, PhD students, I think, at the time at the UPenn uh, Institute of Bioinformatics. It's a really good basic notebook structure. So whenever you want to start doing uh, your own um, kind of Jupyter notebook experiments and stuff, this is like kind of gold standard. Try, try and develop your notebooks to look something like this, like having a table of contents with these like back to top jumps and stuff. These are like super useful, especially when they start to get really big. Um, you want to like break it down into stepwise fashion. This entire um, problem is basically kind of, so what we had done just now was binary classification um, using logistic regression models. So what this is now, um, later part of this will touch on to using decision trees and whatnot, but I know that's um, future work. So I might touch on this notebook again uh, for the next tutorial. But basically this is using a very famous iris data set. It's uh, basically flowers. It goes, it's a three class classification problem. So instead of it being binary, true, false, it's now classifying into whether it's an Ira setosus, Iris veris color, or Iris virginica, um, just based on uh, qualities of the uh, flower petals and sepals. So these are just like two parts of the plant. So it, the width and the length of each the petals and the sepals. So it's a like I say, this is a um, benchmark data set that's used by a lot of uh, different tutorials and examples online. So uh, this is kind of the data set. So again, um, you'd go through the process of loading up the data. This is what it would look like. Um, it goes a lot deeper into data cleaning. So like things like uh, looking for missing data, um, basically cleaning out. So here again, going into pair plots. So here's an example where uh, your data is not always going to be uh, super clean. So let me just run these. Um, the idea of this pair plot is that it's actually printing out five classes instead of three. We expect it to be three, but it seems like there's some duplication in naming. So we have iris varus color as well as a varus color. We have Sarah uh, Satosa and Satosa, I guess. Um, two, two classes are kind of being separated out just based on names. So how do you kind of correct that? So like getting into tidying. So this is how we would want to correct those. Double check that Again, that unique, your data frame has the right number and types of classes. Uh, and yeah, it kind of just breaks down a lot more, like it's a deeper dive into how you kind of clean up data. The text is really well done too. So you should be able to kind of like follow along. If anything's unclear, I will probably touch on this um, in the next tutorial. This is what the distributions look like. Um, afterwards, you can see that certain pairs of these, so the Satosa, this blue, these blue clusters, you can see in many cases there are these nice separating lines um, that could be learned by a model to separate out classes based on combinations of these features. So in the one dimension, if you could draw a straight line down here, you're gonna basically be right all the time for these, but it's a bit harder for these other two classes. Um, it goes into exploratory data analysis again, so hopefully that will be intuitive. It introduces other types of plots. So um, these are violin plots. They're just ways to represent kind of like a box plot, but it also incorporates um, this like kind of kernel density function, so which also gives you a sense of the distribution of the data. So you can see that for some of these, um, there's nice separating out lines that exist as well. The classification it touches on um, is going to get into decision trees. So this is something you'll see uh, as part of the next uh, lecture, I think next Tuesday. 
for Thursday. Um, anyways, you guys will start looking at decision trees, so hopefully uh, we can touch on this uh, then. Bootstrap testing was that thing I kind of had alluded to previously, so um, we want to, in this case, as part of a decision tree classifier, it doesn't really matter what the model is, but the idea here is we want to repeatedly split up our data set into different subsets. So that was that idea of shuffling, grabbing a subset, testing or like training your model and then testing on the remainder. If we do that over and over and over again on different subsets of data and different splits, um, and every time we measure the accuracy, if we do that a thousand times, we can get a good sense of what is the range, what is the distribution of possible accuracies. So if you do something like that, I don't think I'm gonna run this because I don't think, depending on, yeah, this is gonna give errors because I haven't run all these um, cells above, but it basically will give you a, a sense for what is like the minimum, what is the highest, and what is kind of the average performance we can expect of a model under different um, random shuffling processes. So that also gives you a good sense for, is my model actually good? Well, it's good to get a sense for that range for um, how good it could be under different uh, splits. It'll also get into something called cross-validation. Not sure if you guys touched on this in class. If you have, then this is a good way of um, kind of demonstrating that in, um, in Python. Uh, if you haven't, then I'll touch on this definitely next time. It's, uh, this is actually a really fun way to uh, demonstrate how your data is being split into different types of uh, subsets for uh, multi-class problems in what's known as kind of a stratified k of cross-validation. If you have touched on this, Check this out. If you have not, then don't worry. We'll probably cover it in the next one. That's kind of the end of this tutorial um, with a couple minutes left. Does anyone have any questions or is there anything that anyone wants me to cover or is there anything, anybody? Yes, question, go for it, Tenbir. Hi, Kevin, uh, thanks. Uh, the session was pretty uh, organized and looked very useful, thanks a lot. Thanks. Uh, um, I was just wondering, um, for the assignments, I'm assuming we will have to uh, work on notebooks for our assignments, like similar to what we're seeing today? Yeah, yeah. So the well, the first assignment is going to be math-based. So um, I think Daniel is going to be working on that one from, uh, predominantly. I'm going to be doing assignments two, three, and four. Uh, two of those, two and four, are, are going to be more you know model development, kind of stuff like this, right? How do you... Uh, how do you load up the data, explore it? How do you uh, create different um, models and different architectures, test its performance and so on and so forth? You can do that all, I'm gonna have it set up so that it can all be done through the notebook. That way you can kind of like interact with it. You can write yourself notes and kind of document everything as you, as you go along. If that, all right, thanks. Yep, no worries. Anybody else, any questions? If not, we only got a couple minutes. Um, yeah, if not, if there's anything that's like really unclear or um, if, if like things absolutely made no sense and like you, uh, you feel stuck, like if you're at a point where you, you don't think you can kind of like uh, break past um, that, that point to really like continue in learning, feel free to send me an email. Um, hopefully it's the type of thing that we can kind of just like figure out and get, uh, Get resolved so that you don't get stuck in like in the future but if you're if you're comfortable with these notebooks if you're able to run them um, and it makes sense kind of uh, working through them all and you have a good uh, you have a good uh, sense for Python um, I think you are all going to be kind of well set up to at least explore uh, these things and there is a wealth of notebooks out there so if there's anything that you're kind of like curious on or like confused about you can probably find it online. The beauty of the machine learning community is that absolutely everything is open sourced and made kind of as freely and widely available as possible. So, so yeah, um, any last remarks? Because if not, I'll probably end the session and then go work on uploading it for those who, who couldn't have joined. Uh, assignment one, I think. Yeah, I'm not sure what, uh, what the status of assignment one is uh, for anyone. Um, Either Jim will mention it in class or uh, he will at one of the next ones. But um, yeah, I think uh, as soon as it's out, you'll have uh, 10, 10 days or two, two weeks to, to put it together. So um, yeah, without any further ado then, thanks for joining along. 
Um, I'm going to bring this session to an end and I look forward to the next one. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out. Um, I'll post uh, my email either through, you can email me through CULEARN or I'll post my email on, uh, on, the, on the tutorial page. So yeah, thanks for coming. Hope it was fun and I'll see you guys next time.